Food Heals Podcast, Episode 203. And then they evaluated the group with good posture. And here's what they found. They found that this group had a better mood. They felt more uplifted. They had a positive body image. They were saying more positive things about themselves. So by changing your posture, you can change your mood, change your physical chemistry in an instant by changing your posture. Holistic Voice presents the Food Heals Podcast with your hosts, Alison Melody and Susie Hardy. Join the Food Hills Nation and learn the secrets to go from feeling unwell to healing yourself. Warning, side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, an increase in sexual activity, feelings of joy, cravings for kale and quinoa, and a spike in Tinder matches. In real cases, women have experienced a strong desire to stop asking their boyfriends if they look fat and stress. If you experience any of these symptoms, post a selfie to Instagram immediately. All right, welcome, Food Heals Nation. Thanks for joining me. I'm Allison Melody, and did you know that May is actually Posture Month? I know that now because today's guest told me so. She is the co-founder of the American Posture Institute. She's made it her life's work to help others learn every detail about posture and how to become posture experts in their own communities. Today, we're chatting with Dr. Krista Burns. But first, Food Heals Nation, Susie, Leslie, and I are off to Italy, but while we're gone, Sophie Uliano, great friend of the show, incredible author, is putting on a fabulous Wellness Weekend event here in LA, June 9th and June 10th, and you've just got to be there. You can use our discount code. It's foodheals20. You'll get 20% off the ticket price. That's a great deal, and that's at sophieuliano.com slash gorgeous for good LA. So let me tell you a little bit about what's going on. It's going to be an unforgettable experience. Her events always are. Um, I've been to quite a few of them, including her Palm Springs retreat and getaway, which was absolutely fantastic. She gathers the best experts and her teaching style is fun and funny and joyful. It's just such a great experience to be in her presence. So it's two days of wellness, 12 hours of fun. There's going to be life-changing workshops, experiences, innovative treatments, and leading wellness experts. And don't forget the swag bag. It is worth over a thousand dollars. So that's more than your ticket price. So you're going to make money if you come get the swag bag with all the swag that you're going to get. And she always has the best stuff in her gift bags. So there's going to be plant-based vegan lunch. There's going to be holistic skin consultations, beauty makeovers, lots more. There's going to be a hormone balancing section with Candice Birch from Your Hormone Balance. There's going to be mindful meditation. There's going to be fitness and foam rolling with celebrity trainer Ashley Borden. There will be a psychic card reading with Harriet and the Star. There will be lots of guided visualizations and intention setting a sustainable stilettos a vegan fashion show. I'm so sad to miss this. I can't even tell you. And you're just going to learn so much from all of these experts and you're going to be in a community of amazing people because Sophie really does cultivate an amazing group of women. So you should go. Unfortunately, I can't be there. Susie can't be there. Leslie can't be there because we will be in Italy. Our trip is full. So we're so excited to have Food Heals Nation coming with us. But for those of you who can't come with us, if you're in LA, this is a camp miss event. And again, go to sophieuliano.com slash gorgeous for good LA. Use the coupon code foodheals20 to get 20% off your ticket. And before we get to my interview with Dr. Krista, I wanted to tackle a question that was emailed over this week. And I know it's a pain point for many of you. And I wanted to get on one of my favorite guest co-hosts to help answer this question. Roll it, Roxy. Hi, Whitney. Thanks for joining me for a little Q&A. Thanks for having me, Allie. Yes. So this question is perfect for you. It comes from Asia. So Asia says, first of all, thank you, Fierce Females, for the work that you do. You're welcome, Asia. And thanks for calling us Fierce Females. Asia says, I've been binge listening to the podcast since I discovered it in December of 2017 and made it my New Year's resolution to change my diet and get healthier. I'm definitely eating healthier now than I was last year, but I haven't taken the full leap into veganism yet. But I am inspired by the stories of your podcast and people who have changed their bodies, gotten rid of toxins, and truly changed their health. So my question is, when it comes to veganism, where do I even start? I live in Mount Dora, Florida, and while there are some vegan options at some restaurants, my friends and family don't really eat this way, and I'm finding it really tough to go 100%. Any advice to help me go vegan for good? So Whitney, I wanted to bring you on because I knew you'd be the perfect 
person to help answer this question because you have your book, Healthy Organic Vegan on a Budget, which really helps people make the transition. So what advice do you have for Asia? First of all, I would let you know, Asia, by the way, I love that name. (laughs) As soon as you said, I'm like, wow, that's so nice. So it just sounds nice. Asia, you're not alone. This is very common. This is one of the most common questions I've received in my 10 years of running my brand Eco Vegan Gal Mm -hmm. and just having conversations. I've been vegan for about 15 years. And this also just comes out up, up in a lot of personal conversations. And I think it's because maybe sometimes people think that they need to do it 100% and they need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And they're concerned that if they're not perfect, then they don't qualify as an official vegan or that people are going to judge them if they don't, you know, they don't do it right. So I would say to take off that pressure and really just allow yourself to go in that journey if that works for you. Now, there are different approaches based on your personality. So I have a bit more of an all or nothing personality. And I'm a very quick person to like, I I make changes very fast. You're a quick learner. Yeah. And I I went vegetarian overnight, virtually, literally, I think. One night I had meat and then the next day I didn't have any for the rest of my life. So yeah, that's how I gave up chicken. I ordered it at a restaurant and I had just read Skinny Bitch and I sent it back because I remembered I had just read the book on the plane and then I never ate it again. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I didn't even have the courage to send it back because my grandma had made me a chicken meal and I was like, oh, I had already started thinking that I was going to go vegetarian. I'm like, okay, I'll have this one last meal. Oh, uh, can I tell you when I sent it back? I sent it back in front of my in-laws that I had (gasps) never met before in front of Dan's aunt, uncle, his grandfather, and they mercilessly teased me for the rest of the night. Oh my gosh. I've (laughs) never heard that story before. Wow. That's so brave. And what a great example too, because I feel like part of her question is that maybe about being fearful of how other people are going to view her, which is also very common. So going vegan was a slower transition for me. I, I was vegetarian for about six months. And then I got curious about veganism. I started researching it. And I don't remember it being nearly as quick because I felt like there was a lot more to learn. I think that vegetarianism has been around in our culture for so long that it's really easy. You know, you just don't eat meat, but taking dairy out of your diet can feel a lot more daunting because dairy is in so many things like baked goods and sauces and just like all of these extra things that we feel like give things flavors. So I think that becomes a little tricky there. And I would just say one of the the simplest things to do is to just add in more plants to your diet. Actually, there's a great episode on Food Heals with the vegan bros who talk about this. Next and week, so, that's coming up next week. <laughs> perfect timing. So that's yes. super helpful. I love, they have a great book coming out uh, all about this. So I feel Vodka like- Vodka is vegan. <laughs> exactly. And that is a fantastic resource. So one thing that can be super helpful is just reading a lot of books and listening to podcasts because you're just going to- allow yourself to learn. And sometimes you'll have a moment like Allison did where she read a book and suddenly her mind was changed and it felt easy to her. So everybody kind of has a different approach. Some people watch documentaries and feel that way, or some people just need that time and experience or the support of a community. So for example, I have an online community called Eco Vegan Pal, which helps people in that gives them a support system. So if that's something you're interested in, you can go to ecoveganpal.com and learn more about the the support that I offer online and and I'm actually working on doing more in person events around the country, but anyways if you if you add in foods and then kind of crowd out the foods that you no longer want to eat. So just allowing yourself to find the plant-based foods that are really satisfying and delicious, you know, uh, that will make it easier for you to let go of foods that you might feel like it's it's tough to let go of, and then. I would actually just write down or mentally take note of the foods that you really love that contain animal products and look for a plant-based version of them. So if it's donuts, you can find vegan donuts all over the country. And if they're not within your area, like a half an hour away or something, 
and by the way, you might be very surprised, like just doing a search on, on a platform like Yelp or a great resource is Happy Cow. They'll show you all sorts of places you might not have guessed have vegan options. If you can't find something like donuts, for example, then I would say you could actually order them in the mail. There's great websites like veganessentials.com where you can get like anything sent to you. You can use Amazon. You can use this great site called Thrive Market. There's a ton of online sites that will deliver whatever food you want to you. So just think about the things that you really enjoy and find a plant-based option and try them. And you might need to try a few things like yogurt's another example. There are a bunch of plant-based yogurts. Some of them are easier to find in stores than others. Again, you can order some online if you're having trouble, but you need to try a few until you find a brand that you really like. So don't just try one and give up thinking that plant-based yogurt isn't appealing to you because it might be the brand, it might be the flavor, it might be so many factors. And I think that that can really help help make it easier for you. And then also not rushing yourself. You know, you don't have to be 100% vegan right away. You can become 80%, 85, 90, 95, et cetera, maybe 99%. And you just allow yourself to inch closer until you feel like you're at a place where you're happy. Yes. And I love the resource you just brought up for anyone listening. You can go to happy cow and you can look in your city at the city you live in or a city you're visiting or flying to or driving through and find the best vegan and vegetarian restaurant. So I just looked up Mount Dora, Florida, where Asia is from. And it looks like there is a place called cafe 334 on 334 North Donnelly Street, and it is vegan organic bakery. Then you've got a Chipotle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Health Basket Market and Bistro has vegan options. Mellow Mushroom has vegan options. Shiva Indian Restaurant has vegan options. Wave Asian Bistro and Sushi. So a lot of restaurants have vegan options that you don't even realize. A lot Mm -hmm. of sushi restaurants have so... I love going to sushi, and I don't eat seafood anymore. But yeah, yeah, there's so many little meals you can make with the rice and vegetables and um, same with Mexican. There are always always options for you. So anywhere you go, you can usually make something vegan and there's a lot of things on the menu that are accidentally vegan anyway. And that's what's great about Happy Cow is it's all vegan. So they'll they'll show you options at non-vegan restaurants or entirely vegan restaurants. And they have great reviews from people that have actually been there. So it's kind of like Yelp, but specifically for vegans. I like to use Yelp and Happy Cow side by side because sometimes Yelp has options that aren't on Happy Cow. So you can find so many great places if you're not comfortable yet going in and just reading the menu, sometimes that can feel overwhelming. So using these online resources can just help make it easier. For sure. And what suggestions would you give? You and I have a lot of mutual friends who make vegan cooking really easy with YouTube videos and podcasts and things like that. So who who are some recommendations? Who do you watch or who do you know that you would recommend that people could check out to make recipes at home and make it easy and affordable? and fun and delicious. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I'm I'm somebody that when I just kind of think of what I want to eat and then I look it up on on the web and I type in like vegan milkshake or, you know, vegan spaghetti recipe. I'm just making this stuff up. Right. You know, I'm not somebody that really follows any specific people. I I know it's a tough question because I have so many friends that are chefs. So it's a very long list and each of them kind of specializes in different things. So it depends on what you're looking for. And that's why I would say is to, you can use Instagram, you can use Pinterest, you can just search through Google. You know, Google will help you find a vegan version of anything and then look at a few recipes and see which one is more appealing. Maybe the photos look better or the ingredients are simpler. And I just like to experiment that way. I'm not somebody that really cooks out of cookbooks unless I'm reading it for the first time. I I just really use um, use Google. And then I actually love this really great meal planner called Plan to Eat. Mm-hmm. And Plan to Eat is a fantastic tool that I found. It works with your desktop computer. And also there's an app for your phone and you can 
use it to search for recipes, and then you can add in recipes from anywhere on the web into this meal planner. It'll create shopping lists for you. It makes it super simple and organized, and you can add in your own recipes too. So I use it for all of those things, and then I just open up the app on my phone when I'm out of the grocery store and pick up the ingredients, and then I can easily make whatever I I want. Yeah, those are great resources. Thank you. And I also think just looking at YouTube or Instagram using the hashtag like vegan recipes, you can find so yeah. much. And a lot of our friends are these phenomenal vegan chefs. So they can kind of inspire you like Vince Leah or Jason Robel or Leslie Durso or who else? I mean, Emily Turner. There's so many people who are out there doing this for you for free. You don't need a YouTube Red, red subscription or even a Netflix subscription. <laughs> you can just go on your phone and find people doing recipes all day long that'll kind of yeah. make your day a little easier, especially if you're just starting. Because I just think that it's not so easy for everyone to whip up something in the kitchen as it is for others. And so if you can watch someone do it and do it along with them, then you're yeah. set up for success from the beginning. Absolutely. So, yeah. Asia, I hope that we've answered your question. Um, Whitney has a great resource. It's your ebook called Healthy Organic Vegan on a Budget. Where can people get that, Whitney? It's super easy. The domain is veganebook.com. So easy. Veganebook.com. <laughs> Won't forget yeah. that one. No. Nope. And- you know, before we go, I have to plug our favorite plant-based milk, Oatly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oatly yes, will change your really life. really good. I will say that Oatly, it's harder to find at the moment. It depends when you're listening to this. Maybe in the future, it'll be like at every grocery store and I wouldn't be surprised. I actually, though, I feel like they're just, their standard milks are not that exciting. But to me, what makes Oatly special is the barista blend that you can get at cafes. So from, and that also for me is a big deal because I am sensitive to almonds and soy. Mm -hmm. So there, there's really great almond milk out there. Like Califia Farms makes fantastic products and there's so many options out there. So delicious, makes great products. I just, for me, I'm really loyal to Oatly in terms of getting a fancy latte at a cafe, or you can actually buy this barista blend if you want to make your drinks at home, which I do. So I'll, I'll get Oatly and like whip up really nice matcha lattes or coffee lattes or just tea lattes. And I feel like I'm a barista at home. So if yeah. you're looking for that experience, Oatly Barista Blend is top of the line, in my opinion. It's nut-free. It's just made from oats and a few other ingredients. So it's low allergen as well. Yeah, it's really delicious. And I feel like you can make the switch easier when you have delicious options. That's my favorite. If you have kids, the chocolate oatly milk. I mean, mm. I drink that by the gallon. I have it in my fridge right now. And you can order this on Amazon. So a lot of this stuff, if you can't get it at a local store, you can check out you know, online where you can buy their products. Amazon is actually becoming a great resource for vegan yes. food and vegan products. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Whitney, for answering our question today. I really appreciate it. Of course. Always happy to help. All right, Food Heals Nation. I'm switching gears. Next up is my interview with Dr. Krista. We're going to be talking about how to heal chronic back pain, power posing, and how good posture can add years to your life. Next up, my interview with Dr. Krista. The Food Heals Podcast starts now. Dr. Krista graduated with honors as a doctor of chiropractic from Palmer College of Chiropractic. Passionate about furthering her education, she is completing a doctorate in health administration with an emphasis in health policy. She is an inspiring public speaker. She has been a featured presenter at conferences such as the World Congress of Neurology and Neurological Disorders, published author and makes the media rounds on outlets like Fox News and Global Woman Magazine. Welcome, Dr. Krista. Hi, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here with you today, Ali. Yeah, so glad to have you. And I'm so glad our mutual friends, John and Kate, introduced us because this is such a good topic for us. Yeah, it's so great to be here. We love what you're doing with Food Hills uh, Podcast and Food Hills Nation. So thanks so much for having me on. I can't wait to speak to you and to your audience. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. 
Great. Um, my name is Dr. Krista, and I'm the co-founder of the American Posture Institute and PostureArchetype.com. Now, what we do over at the American Posture Institute is we train healthcare providers to help their patients achieve postural correction results. Now, in addition to that, we have a website called PostureArchetype.com. Now, what's amazing about this website is you can go there, and within five minutes, you can understand your posture archetype to help you achieve your posture transformation plan. So how I got to this point is I actually was... Growing up, I was a skier. And from the time I was three years old, I just dreamt of being a professional skier. And I suffered a back injury, which ended my career at US ski team tryouts in the morning. And so after that experience, I just became obsessed with helping people with back pain and helping them understand their body so that they can prevent in a natural solution so that they wouldn't have to prevent ending their career like I did with back pain. So that led me to get my first doctorate degree and from there founding the American Posture Institute. So if you've been an athlete, you know, growing up and you've had, you've suffered an injury like I have, then you can understand how it helps you want to help other people prevent this from happening from them. So that brought me to this point of owning the American Posture Institute. Amazing. And, you know, I don't know anyone in my life these days who doesn't have some sort of back problem. I swear it's like everyone's got something. And so how important is our posture and how can we work on our posture to avoid and prevent back pain? Yeah, you know, posture is fundamental to having upright um, upright postural design, which we're designed to have, and to help us move better and have more mobility. So speaking directly to low back pain, I mean, as you mentioned, low back pain, 80% of Americans have low back pain at some point in our lives, 80%. So that's not a small amount of people. That's the far majority of us. And actually, mm -hmm. low back pain is one of the leading causes bringing people to doctor's offices and one of the leading causes of disability worldwide. So good posture helps you prevent low back pain and helps you have um, good mobility so you can move properly and prevent what I call postural collapse. When you go into those compromised positions, that can then lead to further injury, such as you, you hear people say that they blew their back out or you know, going into a disc, uh, disc herniation or having um, a strain to the low back. So upright postural design helps you support good upright posture and prevent those compromising positions that could lead to more back pain. And I'm seeing this and I'm making a correlation that may or may not be true. So please keep me honest, but I'm seeing this more and more that people younger and younger are having chronic back problems. And I think it's the cell phones because we're all like down on our phones with our shoulders hunched over and our necks down. And that can't be good for us. Allison, I'm so glad that you mentioned that. And that's one of the most important things when it comes to posture. Posture is declining at the speed of technology everywhere around us. Just as you mentioned, every time you turn around, you see people and slumped forward posture looking at their devices. Now, the solution is not to get rid of your device. I'm not going to tell you to throw away your smartphone, and I'm grateful for our ability to connect right now virtually so we can keep our technology. But it's important to understand how this is impacting our posture and can lead to postural degeneration and postural collapse. And as you mentioned, we're now seeing signs and symptoms of back pain in children as young as 6 years old, 10 years old, that should be up and outside playing, but they're stuck on their devices, they have poor posture, and now they're presenting with postural degeneration at a very young age. I just raised my microphone and I'm sitting up so straight right now. <laughs> I know it helps. I like to stand up while I'm doing interviews because it helps me, one, you know, it helps me project from the diaphragm, but also it helps keep me um, in a more energetic posture and keeps, keeps us upright and a higher level of energy. Brilliant. I know I need a standing desk for podcasting, which I don't currently have, but I could raise my mic and just stand up. So <laughs> you got it. <laughs> awesome. Okay. And so what if we are suffering from pain right now? I know that a lot of people go through this. I've been through this myself where you're experiencing chronic pain and you haven't been able to find that doctor or that proper person to help you overcome that pain. And I know I have, you know, when I was in a car accident, I was on my way. Let me just tell you my story. Yeah. I was on my way to yoga teacher training. So here I am doing some really great work yeah. for my back and working really hard on my body. And I was getting certified in level one yoga teacher training. And I got in a car accident on the way to one of the very last days of training. And someone T-boned me. So they hit me, you know, it was their fault. I was completely knocked out. Like I had no idea what had happened. It came out of nowhere. Wow. And after that, yeah, so I, I didn't go to class that day. I went home and like went to sleep and just like slept it off. Um, but that was the beginning of chronic back issues. Now, 
I will say that I think that there are some emotions tied to the back too, and there was some emotional work I had to do. But I started going to physical therapy, doctors, chiropractors, osteopath, and I wasn't feeling relief. I was feeling temporary relief, but it took me a very long time to figure out how to get permanent relief. So what are some things that we can do to start getting relief that lasts? Yeah, that's such a great question. And I can say that you're definitely not alone in feeling that way, where you've sought out multiple different you know, forms of treatment or healing, and you're still experiencing pain. And you're just wondering what is the root cause of that? Now, what's so great about posture is that you can get to the root cause of the cause of your pain, right? So in your experience, you had a traumatic injury, which shifted your body out of alignment. So our goal and our intention then is to bring you back Back into proper alignment and allow your body to heal in that position. So if you stay out of alignment, you know, from a car accident is a huge amount of trauma to the spine specifically. So um, I know you were hit from the side, but for people that are hit from behind, for example, you may be even experiencing whiplash. So we want to get the body in the proper alignment so that it can heal from that position and prevent ongoing compensation postural distortion patterns. So sometimes what happens is you heal from the original injury, but you've been compensating for so long that now this leads to other injuries. So let me give you an example that we can all relate to, spraining our ankle. So if you sprain your ankle, you stay off that, that ankle that's sprained and you start putting all your weight on one side, right? And you start hobbling on the other leg. Well, if you continue to do that for years and you continue to be in that awkward posture that had improper alignment, you're going to eventually develop poor posture positioning and injuries of the other side, right? So we need to get your body in proper alignment as soon as possible so that you can be in an optimal state for healing and overcoming those injuries and healing with proper posture. And just a quick tip when it comes to I'm feeling pain right in this moment is mobility helps override that pain response. So within your joints, you have receptors and these receptors um, called your proprioceptors are faster than your nociceptors, which are your pain receptors. So the more you move your joints, the more you override that pain response. So if you're in a position where you are mobile, then you want to keep moving your joints as much as possible to override that pain response from happening instantly. So that's one of those things. If you're sitting at your desk going, I am in so much pain right now, what can you do? Movement, move that area to increase the amount of proprioception to override that pain response. 100%. One of the things that really helped me, which was um, kind of surprising I didn't realize how effective it would be, but I started a Pilates practice. When I was experiencing the pain from the car accident, I couldn't do yoga anymore when I was in that yoga teacher training because I couldn't do downward dog because it was just too painful. When it and so, flexion, it was hurting you? Yeah. Every, I mean, I couldn't put that much pressure on it. Right. So having a Pilates practice really helped me because I think it was getting me mobile every single day. Mm -hmm. And there's so much back work that is strengthening the back in a Pilates practice. And that was like a side thing that I was doing besides all of the other things, but it was the most consistent. Beautiful. And so that really helped me. So what I love um, hearing about you doing Pilates is I know that Pilates really emphasizes good, strong core control. So I think there's yeah. a, um, like a myth that we all have that a good, strong core equals a strong six pack abs, right? So we look in the mirror right, right. and we judge our core strength based upon, do we have a six pack or not? And I know we all want six pack abs. I know I do too, but reality, if we look at the core musculature and Pilates is so good for this, is why I'm mentioning it, is your core musculature is designed to support your lower back. And so if you have strong core working those deep core muscles, so not just your rectus abdominis, the outer abdominals, but getting to that deep core is going to help support and squeeze your spine so that you can prevent that postural collapse position. So I can imagine that you had great um, results when it came to Pilates because you're probably building that core to help support your spine and maintain that proper postural alignment. I mean, uh, you're probably right. I don't even know, but I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to your accident. So what did you do to overcome that back pain and how did you heal yourself? You know, I went down the road of allopathic medicine first. So, um, I had been experiencing back pain from a really young age myself. I skied moguls. So if, if anybody's a mogul skier out there, you understand the amount of pressure to the spine, right? So if you're a mogul skier, it's kind of like a matter of time. It's almost a joke in our skiing world that it's either going to be your back or your knee, right? That goes out. And so I had had a couple of knee surgeries up until that point, And then it got to the point where my back pain was so bad. 
I suffered a big fall and I got pulled from the race at USQ team tryouts. And what I did instantly is I took advice from the person I trusted the most, which was my ski coach. And my ski coach said, well, why don't you go and get injections in your spine? It's going to help you. That way we can prevent surgery and it'll you know help you heal as fast as possible. And we'll get you back skiing as soon as we can. And that was my number one goal at the time. And so what I was doing is I was actually flying across the country seeking out, you know, highly sought after medical professionals. And I was getting injections in my spine under anesthesia once a week. <laughs> and I did this for 16 weeks straight. Wow. I was, yeah. And I had invested into this treatment because I was told that it was the solution to help me keep skiing, which was my number one priority at the time. And was it a steroid that they were injecting? Yeah, it was um, like a prolotherapy. What ended up happening is that after 16 weeks of injections, and I was young, I was 18 and I was in great shape, so I should have come back from this. There's no reason that I shouldn't have responded favorably. But what happened after all these injections was I could barely walk. I could barely bend over without feeling like my breath had been taken away from me. I mean, it was agonizing. I'd try and put my shoes on in the morning and it was like I had a stabbing pain in my back. I could barely walk, let alone skiing. My skiing career ended before my eyes. I felt helpless. And I know that a lot of us experience this at some points in our lives. Maybe you had this right after your car accident or, you know, any of our listeners, you just, you get to that point of feeling hopeless. Like I invested into this, the best treatment out there, right? That's what I was told. And I was worse off afterwards. And so from that point, I just, I kind of had this obsession because I knew that I had to be able to heal somehow. It didn't make sense to me that I would just be, you know, in chronic pain the rest of my life, starting at 18 years old. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, we, we certainly don't want to be defined by our injuries. And so what I didn't realize at that moment as my skiing career ended, but it was opening a new door for me. And that was just to learn more about natural healthcare methods for overcoming back pain. And from that point, I went um, and got my first doctorate degree as a doctor of chiropractic. And then from there, started really specializing in postural correction. Now, from my opinion, the best way to heal from back pain and have better posture is a three component system, which consists of spinal alignment. So spinal alignment treatments, posture rehabilitation, and posture habit re-education. So I actually put myself through all of my systems that I was creating and suddenly I'd felt better than I'd ever had before. So that's how I knew that I was really onto something. And then we started seeing transformational results with our patients in practice and then teaching these systems to other healthcare providers out there as well. I mean, this is amazing. I love how your trauma informs who you became in the world and what you're doing to help others. You know, we talk a lot about that. And I just think that you have a beautiful mission. And I'm so happy that you're out there helping other practitioners so that they can help their patients. I really appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. For, thank you for saying that. And just honestly, if anybody's at that point in their life right now, like I've come back from trauma. And unfortunately, you know, when we're at the point of having a transformation in our life, transformations hurt sometimes right? Like it hurt. I was in physical pain for two years after I was getting injections in my spine. And then looking back now in hindsight, it was all part of my journey, but that transformation was painful. So wherever you are right now in your current transformation, whether you're trying to get to the next level in health, whether you're trying to take your career to the next level, whatever your transformation that you want to achieve, recognize that there's highs and there's lows, you know, and looking back, we know that it was worth it. But in that moment, it can feel hopeless. It can feel like, what am I doing? Am I ever going to get better? You know, you're always searching for that solution. So just know that this just be a little motivating factor for everybody out there that if you keep moving forward, it's part of your hero's journey to experience that transformation and it will come. It might hurt along the way, but you can get to the point where it can be one of those defining moments in your life as well. Absolutely. 100%. And so, so I know that you have your free assessment. So if anyone's listening and they're like, I need to take this right now, um, where do they go? And what will the posture archetype really tell them? Yeah. So just go to posturearchetype.com. And by taking this free assessment, you're going to determine your posture archetype. So there's four different posture archetypes. There's the ergo archetype, there's the structural archetype, the dynamic archetype, and the neuro archetype. Now, what's so important about this is knowing your posture archetype is your first step to your posture transformation. So depending upon what you do every day at work and depending upon your lifestyle factors, depending upon your history, whether you've had trauma or not, based upon where 
you present right now, we have a postural transformation solution designed specifically for you with your needs in mind. So our ergo archetypes are going to have a very different treatment plans than our dynamic archetypes. So wherever you are, you can determine that with this free assessment. And then, you know, this assessment and these, these transformation programs have arised from working with thousands of patients in practice, as well as just thousands of hours of studying posture, understanding the research, understanding the best methods to help you achieve your posture transformation. And what about the emotional component to healing? Because sometimes when you're in pain, you might be doing everything right physically, but you're unable to heal because your emotions aren't there and you may be in emotional pain at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that? Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you mentioned this point because it's absolutely emotional component is so important with healing. Now, if you think about emotions, I want you to actually listen to these words and feel them in your body right now. So if I say the word depressed, what does your body do? If I say the word depressed, I mean, do you just go into a closed posture? You cross your arms, your shoulders go down, you go into a forward head posture. You feel like you're depressed, like there's um, pressure pressing down on you. And then if I say the word uplifted, what do you feel? What, like, what does your body do when I say the word uplifted? I just sit up. Yeah. So you go, you, you bring your shoulders back, your chest goes forward, you know, your head's held up high. So think about that word. You can choose at any moment to be depressed or be uplifted. Now, whether you're feeling depressed and that's causing your um, posture positioning or whether your posture positioning is depressed and then that leads to the emotional component of depression, that's where we need to understand that and recognize that they're, that they're together, right? So at any moment, you can choose to feel uplifted or you can choose to feel depressed. And by changing your postural positioning, it's going to help bring you to a new emotional state. You know, a lot of research out there um, has demonstrated this time and again. Maybe you've heard of power postures by Amy Cuddy, where by maintaining a power posture, which again is chest out, shoulders back, an open posture, so not having your arms crossed. It's like Wonder Woman. Exactly. The Wonder Woman pose, for sure. That's exactly it. So keep that in your mind. And as you're listening, just do this with me right now. You're going to feel instant surge of power. The reason being is because it's going to drop your cortisol levels associated with stress. And it's going to help increase um, testosterone associated with power and dominance. You know, another research study out there showed they actually compared two groups of people. And the only difference between these groups of people were their posture position. So one group had slumped forward posture, that closed posture, that depressed posture. And the other group had the uplifted posture. And what they found is that the group with poor posture had a worse mood they had worse things to say about themselves. Like they were asked to write adjectives about themselves and they were saying things more negative and their level of self-perceived leadership of seeing themselves as a leader was lower. And then they evaluated the group with good posture. And here's what they found. They found that this group had a better mood. They felt more uplifted. They felt more, um, they had a positive body image. They were saying more positive things about themselves. So by changing your posture, you can change your mood. By changing your posture, you can help your body go into a chemically higher level of performance in terms of your mood and your emotions. So I'm so glad that you brought up that component because it's directly correlated and you can literally change your mood, change your physical chemistry in an instant by changing your posture. I love this. And I think I do something similar where I, if I'm in a bad mood or something like that, I start smiling because it instantly can change how you're feeling. Even if you're not feeling like smiling at the time, you just smile and then things start to shift. And the power posing, people, you can do that you know, people do it before job interviews, before going into any kind of negotiation, any place, especially women, where we may feel like we're going into something where our power might feel diminished and we want to power pose for a few minutes in front of a mirror before going into that meeting or that whatever it may be. It is. And, you know, if you've ever watched yourself on video, it's really interesting. If you watch yourself on video, watch your posture and watch your body language. If you see that you have a slumped posture, ask yourself if that's the first impression that you want to give to the world, because you know that having a depressed posture makes you look more depressed. It makes you look like you're in a worse mood. So if you have that posture and you see that on yourself in video, or like you say, before going into a job interview, before going into a sales presentation, what first impression do you want to give off? 
So I know because you guys are listening to this podcast, you want to live at a higher level of performance and health. So do do exactly what Allison was just saying, which is having power posture before going into those important moments of your life. Go in with a smile, go in with a power posture and, you know, rock it out because that's your potential that you're living up to and show the world that with your posture and your body language. I love that. All right. So do you have some posture tips for us? It sounds like the power posing is definitely one of them. What else do you have for some tips? Cool. Let's go through the top five tips. Um, and as we started with the, the interview, you mentioned technology. So that's our number one tip. And the reason being, as I mentioned before, posture is declining at the speed of technology. Now, if we don't change our body position while engaging with technology, we're starting to already see different signs and symptoms that we've seen in previous generations. So I'll get to the tip in a second, just to give you a little context is, you know, we're designed to be upright human beings. We used to be outside um, working for our food and building homes and, and we had high labor jobs, right? But now we're just seated at a desk in front of our technology. So we've seen a shift in our societal positions and the symptoms that we now present with as a society. So next time you're on your technology, which you probably are right now, as you're listening to us, um, some of you guys are at the gym, shout out to everybody at the gym. But next time you're on your technology, whether it's a device like your smartphone or your iPad or sitting at your computer, what I really want you to do is bring it up to eye level. So while you're using your cell phone specifically, it's really common for us to look down. So if, if you just take your elbows, if you could just grab your cell phone right now and do this with us, is if you think about putting your elbows on your chest or your elbows on your abdomen and holding your cell phone from there. So that way your arms are supported so they don't get tired and you can realistically hold your cell phone at eye level to navigate Facebook or go through Instagram, whatever you're doing at the moment or sending text messages. That's going to help you prevent tech neck. If you're on your computer, I want you to just put something underneath your computer so that it raises it up to eye level. You can get a standing desk, which costs a little bit more money, but it's worth the investment. Or you can just take your old textbook that you haven't read in a while and just put it underneath your computer screen and raise it up to eye level, right? So there's a solution whether you want to make the investment into ergonomic equipment or not. But bring it up to eye level so you're not constantly looking down in that slumped forward posture. Yeah, I have my laptop and I take it all around the house. And so I sit in all different places depending on where I feel like being. And I just take a stack of books and I pile them up. And sometimes I've done it in the bed and I put it to eye level because that's really important to me too. And um, with the cell phone, I'm not perfect. I definitely have been known to like have my head down. But what happens is I'm often in public and I'll see other people doing it and it makes me aware. And then I stop and then I sit straight up. I put my shoulders down and I hold my hands up and I do it the right way. And I know that I probably look like the weirdo in there, but I'm like, all right, <laughs> you guys are actually the weirdos. Yeah, that's it. Just because, you know, the new normal is having tech neck posture, but it doesn't mean it's ideal, right? So maybe you look different than everybody else, but you're doing it correctly and you're help preventing postural decline from, from happening. And not to mention, I mean, what this is doing to the, our physiology internally, externally, and even is impacting our brain function, which we'll talk about in a minute. So for our next posture tip, the number two thing, so number one is always tech posture because that's such a large part of our society. Number two is our active workspace. So whether it's the coffee shop culture, like you said, you take your laptop with you all different parts of the house to different coffee shops, or maybe you work at an office in a corporate job and you have a specific cubicle that you work within. Regardless of your current workspace, I want you to start making it more active. So the best solution is to have a sit-stand capable workspace. So again, if you can have a standing desk that helps you um, stand up more often, or another solution is to have um, active sitting solutions. So you can sit on an exercise ball or a posture cushion, and that's gonna help you move more often. So let me give you this visual. Think about sitting in your chair. Our chair is going to hold us upright against gravity no matter what posture we're in, right? Like you have to try to fall out of a chair. Right. And that's a, a good thing and a bad thing. It's good because we don't fall out of our chairs, but it's a bad thing because our posture system is designed to resist gravity by engaging our musculature. When we're not actively engaging our muscles, we go into that slumped posture. So if you actually sit on an instable surface, such as an exercise ball or a posture cushion, now you actually risk falling over, which means that you need to use your posture to hold your body upright against gravity. So you're actually engaging your core musculature while you're working on your computer. You're actually engaging your posture muscles to hold your body upright. That's how you can train your muscles by having an active workspace, even when you're not at the gym, right? So this is fitness beyond the gym 
gym, this is postural fitness, to help you have upright postural design. So our first um, tip is having proper tech posture. Our second tip is having an active workspace. Allison, do you have anything to add to having an active workspace or anything that you've seen that's helped you be more active throughout your day? Well, I love the medicine ball and I feel like that's good for your abs as well. So all of you who are like, I want rock hard abs, like I don't have them. I don't know exactly how to get them, but it can't hurt, right? Yeah, you got it. <laughs> and then posture tip number three is to take frequent posture breaks. So I keep talking about gravity. And the reason I'm talking about gravity so much is because we commonly overlook the fact that gravity is such um, a force on our body. It's an ever present force constantly pulling us down. And sometimes with aging, you know, we even make jokes about it. You know, you're starting to droop with age because gravity, you know, gravity's pulling you down. But the reality is, is that it doesn't have to with age. It's how we resist gravity that makes us unique as human beings. You know, us versus animals that are quadruped that are down on all fours. We actually position our body upright over our base of support, which is our two feet. So we're designed to navigate the world from an upright position. Now, when you are taking posture breaks, it helps bring you back into that active posture. So for example, if you're seated at your desk and you start to feel your body droop down and you feel like gravity is literally pulling you down and you, you feel like it's like more uncomfortable to sit in proper posture, that's an indication you need to do a posture break. So what I want you to do, and you guys can do this with us, is just take your palms, stick them out and have your arms out to the side. I want you to press your chest forward and drop your head back. And in this position, just feel your chest opening, feel your arms opening, and feel your head going back. Now, what this is doing is it's reversing the very common postural distortion patterns of forward head posture and anterior rolling of the shoulders. So what I want you to do is to do this for 30 seconds every hour of your workday. Now, it sounds like a lot, but if you just set yourself up for success with a posture reminder, setting an alarm on your phone, it's going to help remind you to take a posture break. Because what's going to happen if you don't is you're going to go straight through your workday and you're going to be on productivity mode, which is good, but you're going to start to feel more lethargic because you have poor posture. So set your alarm to do a 30 second posture break every single hour of your workday to revert, to go anti gravity gravity and reverse that pull of gravity. And then maybe you don't need that fourth cup of coffee because you're feeling energized because you're doing this. You got it. And it's going to help you pay attention. Let me give you an example of how this actually helps bring your body back into an attentive state. So imagine, Allison, you're sitting in class back in college or back in high school, and mm -hmm. you start to kind of drift off in class, right? So imagine you're getting tired. What kind of posture do you have? You have like that slumped part forward posture. You're sitting low in your chair and you start to drift off to sleep. Now, what do you do if the teacher calls your name? What's the first thing you do? Oh, I pop up like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, right? You sit up straight instantly. Yeah. Why is that our inherent response? Why do we sit up straight to be more focused for attention? The reason we do is because the same part of our brain that controls our posture has an ascending or that goes up to the brain to also control our, our um, attention centers. So if I have upright posture, I'm more alert and I'm more aware, of course, then leading into higher levels of productivity. Once I start feeling lethargic, I start feeling depressed down. I start having, you know, some posture and then I start feeling less attentive to the work that I'm doing. So imagine that if the teacher catches you, you sit up straight instantly to show that you're paying attention. If you actually had that posture while working, imagine how much more you could get done because you're at a higher level of attentive state, helping you have high performance posture. So taking posture breaks are going to bring you back into that zone physically as well as mentally. That's great. And um, I think we're covering a lot about what to do at a desk. What if we're sitting in front of TV? People like to relax and slump around. What is the best way to sit if you just want to relax and, and watch a movie or something like that, but don't want to be have detrimental effects on your health? Yeah, that's a great point because we are um, talking specifically about occupation. So what do you do when you want to relax for a minute? Now, the best solution is to actually sit on the floor. So if you have the opportunity within your house to enjoy a nice movie but sit on the floor, you're still, um, you can be comfortable but you're still being functional. So we're designed to sit in different positions. You know, again, the chair holds us upright. So if we can sit on the floor and hold our body upright, even if we're in a relaxed position, then it's going to be more stimulating and more functional. And if you really just want to lay out on the couch, <laughs> then it's best <laughs> to be laying upright or laying on your side. So avoid laying and also sleeping positions. Avoid sleeping and laying on the couch on your stomach. That's going to add a little bit of um, additional stress to your lower back and create awkward 
forward positioning of your neck because you're going to be turned more so to one side than the other. Yeah, I can't sleep on my stomach. Even if I get a massage, I feel I'm like, this is so awkward sleep laying this way. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is I slept on my stomach my entire life. And then I get oh, to really? the point of having back pain. It's like, well, no wonder every single night I was in a compromised position, right? So oh, yeah. it's, it's interesting, the small things that we do, like sometimes we don't even think about the position we sleep in, but it actually has a tremendous impact overall over time. So if I spend eight hours per night in a compromised posture, then imagine what that's doing to my body over time, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Um, so the next tip that I want to give everybody is to use a posture reminder. Posture reminders are so important for posture habit re-education. Now, Allison, you've had your posture for a lot of years until this point, right? You've had your posture for years and years before today. So the reality of changing your posture overnight by changing your habits is not realistic. And I want to set you guys up for success so that you can change your posture habits. It's not going to be one posture break that makes all the difference in the world. It's not going to be sleeping on your back one night that changes your posture overnight, literally. So what we need to do is we need to re-educate our posture habits. Now, the only way you're going to remember to re-educate your posture habits is with posture reminders. So one of the things I've always recommended to our patients is that to put stickers in the four places that you spend the most amount of time. Now, we used to give them stickers that said, check your posture, but you can just use any sticker. I mean, just a small one. If you were to put that on your computer, for example, and you see it, it's a reminder that reminds you to go into good posture or to take a posture break every hour. You can also set an alarm on your cell phone that's going to remind you between switching tasks, for example, to take a posture break and then go into the next task. Um, we also have these little bracelets that we wear that says check your posture. And it's just a good reminder to have good posture throughout the day. So I challenge everybody to um, think about what you can use as a posture reminder, whether it's a special bracelet that you're wearing, whether it's a sticker that you're using, or whether you're going to use you know, an app on your cell phone to give you a reminder, set yourself up for success so you can actually make those transitions and those changes because those lifestyle habits that we have, you guys know this. I mean, the things that we do every day add up over time and have a tremendous impact on our spine. Yeah. And I do like reminders. I have some of my affirmations in different places near my computer, near my mirror, places that I am often. And I love stuff like that because it's nice to remember what it is that, you know, I'm, I'm all about self-help. So anything that I can do to remind myself to be a little bit healthier every, you know, hour, if it's just getting up and stretching, or if it's saying something positive to myself, or if it's now I'm going to do the posture, which I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm doing backwards one, which feels really good. I love that. Um, so I love reminders like this. I'm all in. Yeah. And in addition to the reminders, I, something you just said um, triggered a new idea, which is while you're going through your goals, right? That can be the perfect moment to practice power posture. Yeah. So you're already at a level where you're, where you're, you know, you're all in, you're going through your goals, you're going through, um, you know, your mindfulness for the day, you're setting the intention for the day. Why not think about your posture while doing this so that you can help get your body in alignment with where your mind is in that moment? So go into a power posture and go over your goals. You know, Tony Robbins talks about the difference between visualization, incantation, actually feeling it with your body. So think about how you can um, integrate a power posture throughout the day, you know, as an example, when you're going through your goals in the morning. Yeah, I love that. And just making it a part of your daily routine. You know, sometimes it takes us time, like you were saying, to really create a change. And that's okay, but just do a little bit more each day than you did before until it becomes a rhythm and it becomes a part of your daily routine. I love stuff like this. I'm definitely going to start incorporating, especially because I do sit a lot and I have, I prioritize exercise. I actually love working out and I make it a part of my daily routine, but that doesn't mean I'm not sitting somewhere for hours, whether I'm working on the computer or sitting here podcasting. So these are great tips for anyone. Even if you are someone who is very active, we're still not meant to be sitting for the amount of hours that most of us are sitting. Yeah, and that's a really important point because we've actually seen with the research that if you have a sedentary occupation and you are seated for about eight hours per day, which is very common, this is the average American these days, right. then working out at the gym for 30 minutes per day is not enough to offset the ill health effects of sitting all day. Right. They say sitting is the new smoking. You know, it is having so many detrimental effects on us that we don't even know. And yes, 
like I was telling Chris, that's so funny. I was telling someone this the other day and he was just totally poo pooing it. And he was like, well, I, I don't have time for that. So I just go to the gym at the end of the day and I make up for all the sitting and I'm like, but it's not, I'm not trying to lecture you, but it's not making up for it. And so you have to do something in the middle of the day. It doesn't mean you have to go work out hardcore at the gym, but if it's getting up every hour and taking a walk or something to not be sitting for eight hours straight, you got to do it. It is imperative for our health. It is imperative. And it's really interesting because I don't want anybody to think that their daily workout is not a good idea because it certainly is. I sure, definitely yeah, yeah, we're not saying that. <laughs> yeah, don't stop working out. But the thing is, is you have to realize that it's not enough anymore. Our, our society has changed. We're now attached to our desks and we're seated constantly and we're on our technology. No, so not only is this, you know, being in a sedentary posture, not only is it leading us down the road of obesity, type two diabetes, cardiovascular disease, but also what that's doing for our brain is we're having less stimulation than we used to from our natural environment. All of our stimulation is coming from blue light from our device. So you need to be up and moving around and engaging your body in different postures, having different stimuli to your brain and moving moving your joints and moving your body so that you can stimulate better health. I mean, if you look at the research showing the difference between obese and non-obese people, it's really striking because certainly, you know, exercise and diet plays a, a role. Absolutely. hundred percent. But what they found is that one of the main differences is that the non-obese group was um, active during their workday two hours more. They were on their feet two hours more than the obese group. Mm -hmm. So imagine just walking around two hours more per day and not two hours straight by any means, just by, you know, taking a walk to the coffee machine or, you know, taking walks throughout your day and having an active workspace. That's the difference between obesity and not. And we know that if you develop obesity and, and for everybody who's listening on this podcast, you're looking for answers food heals. You guys get this. So help translate this to other people that being more active throughout your workday is going to help offset, you know, the ill health effects of being so sedentary. Yeah. And I think this is a great thing that's come out like the Fitbits and all of the things that track mm -hmm. your steps. That's a great place to start because it's so easy. You can do competitions with your friends. I remember when I first got mine, we were all trying to see who could get their 10,000 steps in first each day. So it was really motivating to make sure like I wanted to win or I wanted to be in second place. And so I wanted to get my steps in um, throughout the day. And it was just great motivation. And it definitely kept me more active than I would have been without it. So there's little, you know, cheats and hacks and things like that you can do make it fun with friends. So it doesn't seem like overwhelming or anything like that. But we got to get up and move. And if you go to the gym, wonderful. If you don't go outside, there's so much you can do take a walk, take a jog, do the stairs, do yoga in the park. I mean, the, the options are limit, uh, unlimited. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just finding ways of moving that suits you and suits your schedule. But you got to schedule it too, because if not, it's so easy to just get in that work mode and literally four hours can pass and you're still seated at your computer in that slumped forward posture. Now, you mentioned that sitting's a new smoking. And what's so interesting is that we've seen from research that if you're seated more than eight hours per day, then that's directly leading you down the road of early mortality. So not only the quality of your life is impacted, but the quantity. So if sitting's a new smoking, what we've also seen from the research is that having poor posture, that posture hyperkyphosis, so imagine a C-shaped spinal curvature with your shoulders forward, is also independently associated with early mortality. So if you think about that, it's like having a smoking problem and a drinking problem because <laughs> right? sitting is the new smoking leading you towards early mortality. It's taking years off your life, whereas poor posture is also doing the same thing. So if sitting is the new smoking, sitting in poor posture is like having a smoking problem and a drinking problem. So at what point do we finally make the commitment to change? I mean, I want you guys to change now before it gets to the point of chronic disease, before it gets to the point of you can barely move without being in pain before it gets to the point where it's really holding you back the quality of your life. And of course, impacting the quantity of your life, you're designed to have longevity, to have vitality, to move in different positions, not to just be seated in front of a device the rest of your life. Right. I mean, what, what about that is fulfilling? Exactly. You're so right. Get off the devices. I mean, we all need them for business. We all need them for a little bit of an enjoyment, but 
do a detox, do a digital detox and see how much time you can spend away from all of these devices. I know I'm on mine right now. I'm on a podcast with you. I'm at my microphone in front of my laptop. But after this, I'm sure as heck going outside and I'm going to go do something, whether it's walk my dogs, just get out in nature, not take the phone. I don't take my phone anymore when I walk my dogs. I used to make Snapchat stories and Insta stories about walking my dogs. It's so unnecessary. It's just taking me out of the moment and no one really cares. Like what is the purpose of, of documenting every single thing we're doing, you know, leave this phone at home sometimes and go do something for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And make it a priority because if not, again, we just go into our fallback habits and our fallback habits are just sitting around on technology. And again, please don't think that I'm anti-technology. I would be a hypocrite right now, right? I mean, we're connected virtually right at this moment and I'm appreciative of that, but I'm also standing while doing this interview. I'm moving. I'm actually doing knee mobility right now, right? As I'm standing here. Um, you're brilliant. I want to be you. And now I want to get like a bike or a treadmill in here and like do something active while I'm podcasting. It's my new idea. Okay. Yeah. And honestly, at the end of the day, I mean, imagine that if you were to check it on the Fitbit, how many more steps would you have in place if you had a treadmill and how much more mobility could you have in your joints if you were just moving throughout the day? So I really just want to encourage everybody who's listening that it's not about just making, you know, this massive transformation overnight and changing everything. It's actually just taking small steps, but integrating it and scheduling it throughout your day to help you engage with technology in a healthy manner. So make technology work for you. Don't be, I always say it's posture by design, not by circumstance. So design your posture while engaging with technology. Don't let your posture be designed by the circumstances of your environment, because if you don't take action, it will be designed and defined by the circumstances of the environment that you're in on a daily basis. I love that so much. Thank you, Dr. Krista. And I'm going to go take a walk with my dogs right now. But what um, pearls of wisdom do you want to leave us with today? You know, the last thing that I want to mention is that everybody should have a posture evaluation with posture imaging on a yearly basis. So just like we have all yearly evaluations that we do, it's crazy to think that up until this point, we probably neglected the postural design of our body, the structural framework of our body. So I want to encourage everybody to go over to posturearchetype.com and determine what your posture archetype is. That's the first step towards your posture transformation and have a yearly posture evaluation to make sure that you can detect early if you are experiencing postural distortion patterns. We want to reverse those before they start impacting the quality and quantity of your life. Again, you're designed to have longevity, vitality, and to live healthfully. It's posture by design and not by circumstance. We'll see you over at posturearchetype.com. Beautiful. Thank you so much. So go to posturearchetype.com. You've also got a beautiful site, AmericanPostureInstitute.com. And where can everyone follow you on social media as well? Yeah, check us out on Facebook, um, facebook.com forward slash American Posture Institute. And if you want to join a community of like-minded individuals who are on their posture transformation journey right now, you can join our free Facebook group, My Posture Transformation. I love free Facebook groups and talking to people who are doing what I'm doing and asking questions and answering questions. It's so much fun. So I'll definitely be joining. Krista, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for all the value that you provide and for welcoming me into the Food Nation tribe. I'm so happy to be here and it's great to connect with you. Thank you again for providing these healthy opportunities and options to all the listeners. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Side effects of this podcast may include increased health and vitality, thoughts of living longer, developing a more positive outlook on life. In rare cases, people have experienced a strong desire to put down the Ben and Jerry's, get off the couch, and take a walk outside. If you experience any of these symptoms, tell your Facebook friends immediately.